the leader of the New York Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. And that research unit is a research unit that does research that's a cooperative research. So we do research that's of applied interest and need of our cooperating agencies. And so those are federal agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, and then also the state agency like the um, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. <coughs> Okay, so any good scientist wants to learn about their audience, right? So when I go out and study animal populations, I need to learn about the wildlife species. And so before I came here, I wanted to learn a little bit about the, the wildlife critters that run around the halls of Dryden. And so um, I was thinking about using one of these. Does anyone recognize what this is? What's that? Trail cameras. Yeah. Who here? Does anyone here hunt? Okay, so some people are familiar with this because a lot of people use this for hunting. This is a trail camera, and what this trail camera does is you can set it up and it's motion activated. There's no lights or anything, but anytime something walks in front of it, it'll take a picture. And so I thought it would be a good idea to give one of these trail cameras to Mr. Crocker to try to capture the wildlife of, of Dryas. And the first thing that happened is Mr. Crocker gets this thing, and he's like, public directions, and he doesn't know that when the camera's actually on and taking all of his pictures of him trying to figure out the device. You had to know, giving me these pictures, that you did it. So, you know, he's calling the 1-800-HELP number here, <laughs> and then he gets it out and he takes a picture of his finger, a picture of his knee maybe, not quite sure what's going on here. And then uh, Mr. Rice Weber's nose, I guess, <laughs> thought that was a good idea, like nose hair pictures or something. Um, and then they're all standing around it, like, is something wrong here? Is this working? And look at the look at their their hands. They're all like, hmm. I love those pictures. There's a lot of confusion going on in these photos. These are the best photos out of all of them. Better than all of you students. It's just setting up the camera. And then, no comment. I have no idea what was going on here or why he was doing this. Okay? I'm pretty sure that's you, though, right? I wouldn't know. No, okay. <laughs> no idea. Okay, so this is the happy picture. I think they got it to work here. So um, thank oh, you to both for, for setting this up and getting these. Uh, and I have a special prize for you after. Okay, so they were successful in getting 8,674 photos um, from this camera right here. Um, unfortunately, most of them look like that, um, <laughs> the side of the building. But there are some photos of, of the students here. Um, and so what did I learn about the students or the wildlife of Dryden? Anyone see it? Is there, is there anyone in there? Ah, I see some people that see themselves. Okay, so there's, you guys have a lot of backpacks and books. You're carrying stuff around, which isn't unusual, right? You're at school, so that's a good thing. Okay, did anyone know this camera was out there getting your pictures? Yeah, it was like, it was we were being watched. Oh, yes. Okay, now you're Okay, so lots of backpacks and books. You guys use a lot of cell phones. Always on the cell phone. That's another observation that I made. Not, not talking on them, but just holding them or doing something. I don't know if you're just holding it or doing something on it, but there's a lot of cell phone pictures. <laughs> um, and then I think there's some people that may have seen the camera, but I'm not sure. Are any of these people here in the audience? I don't know, I hear giggles. Are you, anyone, any of these people here? Did they know the camera was there? Okay, the middle guy knows. Okay, so some people I think saw the camera maybe understood that there was something going on. And then, you know, my one observation that I wouldn't have predicted is that three people picked lilacs off this bush <laughs> next to the, the camera. So, you know, if I'm a wild, I am a wildlife ecologist, what would I think? If I, was, if I were going out and trying to do a study of the wildlife of Dryden, I'd probably think, yeah, maybe lilacs are a good thing to use as bait, right? Because three people seem to pick them up and smell them, so I probably have some lilac bushes out where I put my camera to attract these, these wildlife critters. So those are my observations of getting to, to learn a little bit more about you. So I want to learn a little bit more about you before I give a talk and tell you about me. So first, who likes being outside? 
Okay, a lot of people. Being outside is either like hunting or fishing or trapping or hiking or boating or just being outside. Yes. Okay. A lot of people like being outside. How about just exploring? Asking questions about how the environment works. Okay. A few less, little bit less people, but I bet any of those people who hunt that didn't have their hands up, I bet your hand probably should be up because if you're hunting and you're setting out game, game trip cameras or trail cameras, you're probably trying to learn about how wildlife move, right? You're trying to learn why they're in certain areas and not in others. So you're curious about it, but maybe you just don't realize your curiosity. Who likes solving problems? This one might have a few, but oh no. So you guys are good problem solvers, I can tell that. A lot of people like to solve problems. Now, when you finish, when you finish school, who wants to do work that's meaningful, that's important to society? Okay. So all of these things right here are exactly the kinds of things that I get to do in being a wildlife biologist. And I'm going to try to uh, demonstrate some of these things as I go through my talk. So the core area of my research is two different areas, as Allison mentioned. One is I do research on landscape management. So how does the landscape structure influence the way individuals are moving about that? How connected is the landscape for wildlife species? And I design corridors for wildlife to allow wildlife species to move through landscapes. And also biodiversity conservation. How do we ma maintain the variety of species that we have in our environment? And then I also do this applied spatial ecology. So what's the spatial dynamics of animal populations? How does the landscape influence the way that the individuals are moving around? And I do these things, these models, called spatial capture-recapture models, which I'll talk a little bit about. But basically, it allows us to figure out what are the underlying landscape factors that influence the way that animals move. Okay, so I need to tell you, I'm, I mentioned that I wasn't a person who started out knowing exactly what I was going to do. But I grew up kind of around hunting and trapping and fishing and being outdoors. This photo here, um, these two photos here, this is my great grandfather when he was 85 years old um, with two coyotes that he had trapped. And this is him in the background here with his probably 35 year old buddies, he's 85. Um, and this is a huge pile of muskrats. So they trap the heck out of mus muskrats, I guess. I don't know what the muskrat population is like anymore in Vermont, but if it was up to my grandfather, I guess pretty low. Um, so I was around my great-grandfather who, who was doing trapping, and he'd bring me back into his trapping shed, and he'd try to give me tobacco and have me like do chew tobacco when I was like 10 years old. So that was my kind of introduction to, you know, being tough and being outdoors. And I guess I did uh, hop on a snowmobile every now and then, as he was up in the top picture. But I had no idea wildlife ecology was a career. I didn't know it existed. And so what did I do? Well, when I was in high school, uh, I was good in science and math, and I really enjoyed science and math. And I'm the first person in my family to go to college. My parents didn't go to college, my aunts or uncles didn't go to college, my cousins didn't go to college, no one went to college. So I didn't have any advice from anyone who had gone to college telling me different options for careers. But my guidance counselor told me, maybe you should go into chemical engineering. You're good in science and math, a woman in chem chemical engineering will make a lot of money. So I was like, okay, make a lot of money, do science and math, that sounds good. So what did I do? I went to uh, Clarkson University for chemical engineering. And I got there the first semester, and this is kind of the picture, right? First semester I took chemistry and calculus and Fortran um, and physics, and I was in this environment, and I started learning about what chemical engineers do, a little bit more um, deeper understanding than I had maybe when I was in high school. And then I thought, maybe that's not what I want to do. Maybe I want to be outside. But I didn't know what to do if I was going to be outside. But I didn't want to give up this idea about chemical engineering because when I was in high school, that's, that was my plan. That was what I was going to do. And so, since I didn't want to give it up, I made the decision, OK, I need to learn a little bit more about chemical engineering. Going to Clarkson University is very expensive. And I didn't want to waste my parents' money on college if I didn't know exactly what I was going to be doing. 
And so I said, okay, I'm going to take a leave. I'm going to only go one semester, and I'm going to stop going to school. I'm going to learn more about this chemical engineering thing. So back up a little bit to when I was in high school. When I was in high school and I was interested in chemical engineering, I established the first um, junior engineering technical society at my high school. So I developed this club that didn't exist. And I also developed the first chapter of the Society of Women Engineers at my high school. And through this, I made connections, and I shadowed chemical engineers when I was in high school. And so I got out of Clarkson that first semester, and I called up these people that I had met when I was in high school. And I talked to the woman who I had shadowed, and I said, I don't, I don't know if chemical engineering is right for me or not. I'm not sure if I should be doing this. Can I get a job at IBM so I can learn more about it? So I'm 18 years old, okay? So I graduated from high school when I was 17. So I'm 18 years old, and I want to get a job at IBM. So I use my connections. She gives me this job. So I'm chemically processing computer wafers at IBM. And this is what it looks like. You go into this clean environment, and you put on this white suit, and you're in there, and you're mixing up a bunch of chemicals, and this is a computer wafer, and you're processing these computer wafers. And I did that from when I was 18 to 19 years old. And then I really knew that chemical engineering was not something that I wanted to do. And I also did this third shift, by the way. So that was a little foray into learning more about potential careers. OK, so chemical engineering wasn't for me. So then what did I do? I thought, well, maybe I'll go to the city, and maybe I'll use my math skills. So I moved to Boston. OK, now I'm 19 years old. And so I moved to Boston and decided that, hmm, I think I could get a job using these math skills at Filene's. So I was the executive assistant to the vice president of credit for Filene's department stores. How did I get the job? Because I convinced them that I had math skills. I convinced them that even though I had never used a spreadsheet before, Excel spreadsheet, I told them that without a doubt, I can learn how to do what you need me to do. So what did I do? I developed models that basically calculated the risk of filenes about how much debt these consumers could accumulate before it became too much risk for these credit card, for the company to take on the credit card debt. Okay, that wasn't for me either. So I did that until I was 21 years old, working in Boston, and they said they were gonna pay for me to go to school, they were gonna put me to Boston College to actually get my degree. Um, but then I realized, do I really want to be in business? Maybe that's not actually what I want to do. OK, so what did I do? I moved to Maine. And so I moved to Maine, and I started an environmental studies or environmental education. I thought, OK, maybe I want to, maybe I want to be a, a secondary school teacher. I think that would be cool. And so you can see, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? I'm just like moving around from one thing to another and kind of exploring these ideas. And so I went into environmental education, and then I took a botany class, and my professor in botany said, you seem to be really interested in science. Have you ever heard about this career called environmental science? And I was like, no, tell me about it. And so he told me about environmental science, and then I realized that is what I've been looking for. That's exactly what I want to do. So the next day I switched my major, and I went into environmental science. So when, now I'm in, in undergrad, I'm, I'm doing my bachelor's degree. And so one lesson is volunteering is really important. Volunteering when you're in high school, volunteering when you're in college. Sometimes it's difficult to volunteer, I know that. Um, but this is a good way to gain experience. And so I volunteered um, here on the upper left uh, at a wildlife rehab place, basically banding, bandaging up uh, bald eagles. Uh, working with all kinds of species. And then I worked for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation in Potsdam, New York. What did I do there? I banded Canada geese, I banded ducks, captured ducks, uh, installed these things called beaver deceivers, which basically regulates water flow, so beavers can't hear the sound of the water. Um, it won't dam, dam up uh, the water. And then the next summer I volunteered more. So this is now my second summer in my undergrad, and this time I was a volunteer at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I did this through the Student Conservation Association. And the Student Conservation Association is really cool because you can volunteer at a lot of really neat places, and they pay you a small, like, living stipend. Uh, so no salary, but you, they pay you living. 
And so what did I do there? Anyone know what this thing is? Who knows what that, that bird is? A bird. Any other ideas? It's a woodcock. So I captured and banded these woodcock. They have this really long bill that probes for earthworms down into the, into the soil. And this is measuring the length of the bill. And then this is me here um, fighting some fires. Got to learn how to set fires and, and uh, manage fires, prescribe fires to, to manage vegetation. And then the next summer I volunteered more. So you get the idea um, that I spent a lot of time like my free time volunteering at different jobs. This time I volunteered for the National Park Service. And what I did there is I worked on, what's this guy right here? Anyone know what that bird is? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Peregrine falcon. So I worked on peregrine falcons and I monitored peregrine falcons when they were coming into these nests. They nest, nest on cliffs like this. This is at Acacia National Park in Maine. And then I did a, an interpretive program like this, where a bunch of visitors come to the base of the cliff and they want to learn about peregrine falcons. So I educated them about peregrine falcons and natural history and behavior and biology and that kind of stuff. And then I also, the next fall, I did this hawk watch where I was up at the top of Cadillac Mountain watching hawks migrate over and talking to visitors about the importance of monitoring these migrating hawk species and how we count them. What was the payoff of me doing all this volunteer work? <coughs> well, it was that I got into graduate school. And I got into graduate school at the University of Maine, and I did my master's degree there from 1996 to 1999. And I studied this. What's this? Anyone know what this is? Nope, guess again. Close, very close. Martin. 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 Close, they're related. This is like a miniature version of a Fisher, kind of. So this is an American martin. They're the cutest things ever. This is probably my favorite species, actually. Um, so I studied American martin. And the questions that I was asking in my master's research was, if you're harvesting the forest, like a clear cut or a selection harvest, what does that do to the primary prey of martin, which are small mammals and snowshoe hares? And also, how does that influence the spatial dynamics of martin? Do they have bigger or smaller home ranges if they include more or less of what might be considered like suboptimal habitat? And I got to do some cool stuff like trap martin. And so uh, this is my kind of first experience in actually like trapping a live animal and administering drugs. And so we would give it, uh, so this is me drawing up some uh, drug in a vial here, and we actually would give it, it's, it's a street drug, actually, it's ketamine, but on the street it's called Special K. So we'd give a little dose of Special K, and they'd fall asleep for a little bit, um, and then we would weigh them and, uh, and pull a tooth, like a premolar tooth, a little teeny tooth, and we could pull that tooth and we can age and, and figure out how old it is. So a lot of equipment here to, to handle these guys, but they're just doing this can be. There's one in the, the trap there. So this was kind of, kind of a neat experience for me. And then once, once I um, captured them, I would put this on them. This is a radio collar. And so this has a unique identifier. And so you put this with the antenna facing on its back. And this, this unique identifier, we can track it with a device, like a receiver, that emits a frequency that's specific to this collar. And so by tracking that frequency, we can track this animal. And so I spent a lot of time tracking my martin that I had trapped and collared. And how did we track them? Well, we used snowmobiles. I did a lot of this using these antennas with the receiver to listen to the beeps. So I got really good at beep, 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 listening to beeps. Um, and then I spent many, 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 many hours in this Piper Super Cub flying. And we'd fly and we'd listen for the beeps and we'd do a lot of circling at the height of the trees. And once we heard the animal, then I could record where it is on a map. And so I'm trying to learn about where they live, basically. And so this plane in the winter has skis on it. This is a frozen lake that we would land on. And then in the summer, we put floats on it and we'd land on lakes. So you get to do a lot of kind of neat stuff. 
Okay, so there's some not so glamorous things, right? Handling animals is cool, and flying in airplanes is cool. Um, less cool, maybe, is I said the primary prey of martins are, are yeah, martins are small mammals and snowshoe hares. So I actually needed to learn something about what they were eating. So I had to trap small mammals and learn about them too. And I just they just stink. They pee in the traps and they just kind of stink. And so we would ear tag them and capture them and learn about how many there are. So for me that was probably the less than most part. And then we needed to learn something about snowshoe hares. This is one of my technicians here basically counting hair poops on his hands and knees. So we were counting hair poops and developing a relationship between how many hair poops there are and how many snowshoe hares exist on the landscape with a basically like a regression model if you guys have done any kind of regression stuff. And then we would wear these respirators because there's hantavirus, nasty things that you don't want to get. Okay, so this master's work I mentioned, I evaluated what's the influence of this kind of partial harvesting. And in fact, it turns out that when martins include partial harvesting in their home ranges, their ranges have to get bigger. And so you can imagine if your home range has to get bigger, that means you have to move around more. And that means you need more resources because you're expending more energy. So these kind of partial harvests are not good for martin. And so these mature forests are better. We also found out that martins are eating mostly small mammals, like mice and voles and that kind of thing. How did I find that out? by dissecting a bunch of martin poops, basically. So I work a lot in poop. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so next I went on and I did my PhD. So this was from 2000 to 2006. And I put these two photos here of my son, Nolan, because in 2004 is when I had him, when I was doing my PhD. And so any of you women in the audience that Hopefully right now you're not thinking about kids, but sometime in the future when you're thinking about kids, um, it's possible to do a PhD and also have kids during your PhD if you work really hard. Um, so I'd bring him out on some of the studies that I was doing when I was doing my PhD. And for my PhD, I worked on this thing. Who knows what this guy is? Link. Ah, you guys are like the links experts here. So if you want to come up and feel a links after, this is the links right here. So links have these incredible, huge, Feet. So check out their their uh, paws and feel feel the the pellet on that. Okay, so when I was doing my PhD, I was also interested in the influence of this forest harvesting on lynx. But I was doing working on lynx in the winter, so I wanted to learn about more specifically how they're using the structure within their home range. So before I was tracking them and trying to find out where they where Martin were. And now I'm saying, okay, how specifically are lynx moving through the forest, depending on what type of vegetation is there? And so the way that I did that was by snow tracking lynx. And so the lynx were radio collared. And so since they were radio collared, I could use my receiver and antenna, figure out where they were, and then I could follow them backwards in the snow. And then I could GPS the path of the lynx as I followed it through the snow. And so if you get a path like this, then you can do cool spatial statistics with this and figure out how tortuous is this path relative to the vegetation. And so we can use something called fractal dimension. Maybe in, um, in your classes you learned a little bit about fractal geometry. So we can use something called fractal dimension to characterize how tortuous this path is. Okay, the fun stuff is actually is of course capturing lynx like who wouldn't want to capture and handle a canada lynx right mm -hmm. um, so this is me here uh, capturing and putting down a canada lynx there are huge huge feet here kind of measuring the length of the feet putting a radio collar on it checking out their teeth uh, this is how we uh, weigh them and this is actually a lynx in a trap you just can't tell that's that photo i showed you before uh, it's in a leg bolt trap More fun stuff, <laughs> spending all day, all winter, outside, snowshoeing, tracking Canada lynx and learning about how they move through the landscape. Um, this is me with one of these GPS units following a lynx trail. Get there, miles and miles of snowmobiling to try to find out where they are. <coughs> oh yeah, and this was four hours from the nearest town. <laughs> um, 
The other, I put the fun stuff question mark because I think this is fun. Some people didn't think it was so fun. Um, there's me. This is a level of snow. See that head right there? That's me. That's the snow. So it's very, very deep snow. Um, where links live. Traveling through this stuff is very challenging. Um, sometimes it rains. Technicians don't get very happy when it's snowy, <laughs> cold, and they're wet. Um, and then all the time, snowmobiles got stuck. So that actually wasn't the fun stuff, but everything else was really cool. Okay, so I asked some questions. What drives these habitat choices by lakes? So is it the density of snowshoe hares, which is their primary prey? Or is it how visible the snowshoe hares are? Is it how they can actually access the snowshoe hares and, and capture and kill them? And so I had two different hypotheses. One might be they're selecting the vegetation to maximize the density of prey, or two, they're trying to maximize their access to prey, which would mean a reduced understory stem density. But if a reduced understory stem density means that probably the density of hares are lower because hares are associated with high density stems. So these are kind of two counter hypotheses that I had about why they're making habitat decisions. So what did I ask? Well, so my question was, are links trading off hair density for accessibility of, the, of actually capturing and pursuing the prey? Remember I said I was GPSing the paths, so here's one of these GPS paths, and we can measure the fractal dimension of that path, and that's here on the y-axis, and I can look at the fractal dimension, or how tortuous the path is, for males compared to females, and what this is showing is that the fractal dimension of female lengths was greater than male lengths. And we can also characterize when they're making a break in their decisions about movement through the landscape. And the spatial scale at which they're making decisions was different between males and females. That was one part of my PhD. The other part of my PhD was working on Martins in Maine and Martins in Newfoundland. And the question there was, Martins in these two different areas, Newfoundland, Canada, and Maine, evolved in very different landscapes. And the landscapes they evolved in was one, Newfoundland is very naturally fragmented. Maine has a lot of human-induced fragmentation. And so what's the difference of these two species evolving in these very different landscapes? And so, what, whoa, this slide is way off for some reason, but, um, Basically, um, don't worry about any of those lines because they're not in the right places. Um, what this is, is the amount of suitable habitat that are in the home ranges of the Martins in uh, Newfoundland up here and Maine down here. And the two things I want you to take away from this is that the Martins in Maine had a lot of suitable habitat. Some of the home ranges had 100% suitable habitat. But in Newfoundland, the maximum amount of suitable habitat was only 78%. So in Newfoundland, they actually didn't even have the opportunity to have 100% because the landscape was naturally fragmented. And this affected how they responded to fragmentation, to the amount of loss of habitat. And these numbers are shifted over, but Martins in Maine had the greatest response at 70 to 80%, and Martins in Newfoundland at 30 to 40%. And that's when the slope of these lines was greatest, indicating that that's when they saw the most, we saw the most dramatic declines. Okay, after I finished my PhD, I did a little bit, stayed in school a little bit more, if that you know, wasn't enough to, to go through my undergrad, master's, and PhD. Then I was a postdoctoral scientist from 2007 to 2009. What did I do there? I did this landscape biodiversity planning process. Um, I used Martin and Lynx as umbrella species, so umbrella species are species that, if you were to protect the habitat for those species, basically they're conferring the benefits to all of the under spe other species that fall underneath the umbrella. Um, so they have spatial requirements that would be suitable to protect other species. And so I use these two species as umbrella species because Martin require late successional habitat, lynx require early successional habitat. Now you might say, how do you maintain a landscape that has late successional and early successional, and you have an endangered species, or threatened species, Canada lynx, and a species that's declining, American martin. How do you simultaneously provide habitat for species that kind of exist at the opposite ends of the successional spectrum? Well, that's what I, my project, that's why it was challenging, 
was to develop this spatial optimization model about how we can manage the landscape to keep all of these species on the landscape. Um, and what I gave the Nature Conservancy was basically like a prescription or a recipe that said, okay, for the next 50 years, these are the types of harvest that you should do, these are the areas that you should do it, this is how you should do it, these are the areas that you should put as set aside, and I told them how to manage the 180,000 acres that they had just purchased on the um, uh, St. John River in northern Maine. Okay, fast forward to where we are now. Some of the things that I care about and some of the things that I do now are occurrence and occupancy. So where do species occur? How many are there? What are the dynamics of these species? Survival and improvement. Uh, and these are primary questions for conservation and management. And essentially, I developed these spatial models for animal populations. Spatial models that allow us to say things like, this is a map of the occupancy of fishers. And this map tells us, for every pixel in this landscape, so um, you can see uh, Syracuse is right here, so we're down here in the Finger Lakes right here, Albany's over here. So you can see the areas in red are basically Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany. Those are all uh, developed areas. Those are areas that have the lowest probability of occupancy by fishers. And then the areas in green are areas that have the highest probability of occupancy. So I developed these models that allow us to manage these species, work on things like black bears, uh, mink, fishers, and develop models that, says, that say, for example, this is a model for black bears that say, where is the density of black bears the highest, and how, did the, how do black bears relate to the amount of elevation, for example? How do we do this? Well, you know, back to my collaring days, um, now I have graduate students. I don't actually do all of the work, I just train my graduate students now on how to handle wild animals. And my graduate students get to do all the fun stuff, but I get to go out and visit them in the field and, and do the training, which is really cool. So we set snares like this for black bears. Here's a black bear right here. And this is in New York, by the way. This is down in Steuben and Allegheny counties, not far from here. Um, we have barrel traps like this where we capture the bears. We use really stinky stuff like rotting meat. Um, to try to get them to be trapped. You see what this is right here? Can anyone see those boxes? Those are hostess pastries, <laughs> like Twinkies. Bears Ooh. really love Twinkies, um, so we use that as bait. And um, so basically, here's one of my grad students, Matt, my other graduate student, Pat, like lying in a pile of Twinkies. That <laughs> uh, so that was always fun. And then we dart them with a, basically a dart gun. And here's the dart, the tranquilizer dart, and this small black bear there. And then we tattoo their lips. Um, and this is kind of, so here are the ear tags, here's a radio collar. If anyone wants to feel the heft of what it would be like to wear a radio collar around your neck, this is what it looks like. This is for black bear. Smell it, actually, when you come up to it. It smells a little bit like black bear. Um, so we put the ear tags in, we put the radio collar on, and then we also tattoo the 